In this video, we will be ending chapter 15. And in section 3, we're talking about what are the effects of budget deficits and the national debt. So, U.S. national debt on April 2014 was this amount. If we were to take a look at the amount it is currently, we'd be shocked in how much this increases. Uh, there's a few websites out there that have an ongoing total of the U.S. national debt. And it's, it just continues to increase and increase and increase. So the U.S. national debt is a problem. Um, the problem is that we are spending more than what is being brought in or budgeted. So the federal budget is made out of two parts. Revenue, which is taxes, and then expenditures, which is a spending program. So what does that mean? That means that the federal budget should have the perfect amount of revenue taxes coming out that match the expenditures. Expenditures is the things that are being spent in the budget. So they have a list of everything that they want funded, and then they have a list of the taxes. When those balance, that's called balancing the budget, when revenue equals expenditures. So if we need $1 trillion for the budget this year, the revenue should be $1 trillion in taxes equals a million, uh, trillion dollars in what is needed for the budget. Now, whenever we are talking about balancing the budget, whenever there is a surplus, um, that means we did not spend the entire budget. So any money that's left over at the end of the year that is not spent, if there's money left over, that is called a budget surplus. But if we spend more than what we thought we could do, when the budget expenditures exceed revenue, that results in um, the amount of money that was overspent. So if you look at this chart here, we can see that we've had a, a short period where we had budget surpluses, but now it's, it's not even close. Uh, we've been overspending more than, than what could be expected here. Um, We've had different presidents who have called um, having debt unconstitutional, um, unrealistic. And so it's been a problem, but we haven't had strong leadership that has really addressed the problem to fix this. So the budget surplus means we have leftover money. A deficit means we do not have leftover money. If you were to look at the graphs here from 1989 to 2013, Remember, we just talked about a deficit. That means we overspent what we budgeted for. And a surplus means we have leftover money. So if you kind of look at this, as you can see, it's deficit, deficit, deficit. And we have a period of 1998 to 2001 where you actually have a surplus of, of money left over at the end of the year, which then could be used to pay down the national debt. But after that, uh, it doesn't go down. Uh, we go 157, 37, 4, 3, 2, and then 2008, 455 billion, and then 2008, 2008, 1.4 trillion. And we're continuing on this trend for the next four years. And then 2013, we're at 901. So we, we have a spending problem in the U.S. Now, there's two solutions to be able to cover the budget deficit. Again, budget deficit means the money left over or overspent. So what is one solution? Well, we could just print money. If we have trillion dollars in budget, let's say we go over a quarter million, we could just print that quarter million dollars, but the result would end up being that, yes, everyone would get paid, but then inflation would go up because um, items would not be worth as much. Um, We've discussed it before, but about Germany after World War II, they had hyperinflation where things were just increasing so dramatically. Uh, by the time you're finishing your meal or by the time you, you get paid throughout at your lunch break, I mean, it was, it was ridiculously high how high inflation was going. So that's one option is to create new money, just to print it. Not the best option because we can see inflation but it is one option. The second option is to get people to buy into bonds. So 
let's say we need $250 million, we're short, we have a deficit, the government could then authorize $250 million in bonds and make it available to its citizens and other nations. So we're $250 million short, they offer $200 million $250 million in bonds. People buy those up. Now we have the money to meet the budget. And here are the three bond options. People could buy T-bills, T-notes, or T-bonds. And these are all just the same thing, but just based on different times and rates. So that is the second option that we could do. Now, national debt. This is different than a deficit. And the difference is that the national de debt is the amount that continues to accumulate in the pile after year after year after year. So if we look at the deficit here, 2013, let's say we have a deficit. And then what about 2013, 2014, 2015? So every time we overspend our budget, that's a deficit, and that gets added to the national debt and that's what that clock that we would look at at the beginning of this notes that massive number that is national debt so deficits are added to the debts surpluses are subtracted from the debt whenever we have a surplus we can then start paying that debt off the problem is we always have a deficit and as a result of that we're never able to start paying it off if we look at measuring national debt during wartime, obviously it's going to be higher debt because we're spending a lot more when it comes to the military. And during peacetime, we should have lower debt. So it's trying to have a balance there of make sure uh, during this time that if it's peacetime, you should be saving up. If it's wartime, Hopefully the money you've been setting aside is then can be kicked in to cover some of this debt that is included during wartime. Uh, if you look kind of at the peak here during World War II, it was very high, which did result in getting us out of the Great Depression because we did need to spend uh, money on the military. But as a result, we did go into higher debt. And this chart just kind of shows the up and down of, of how the national debt has been going. So, we obviously have a debt problem. Now, how, what are kind of the results of this debt problem? Does it just affect the government, or who does this really affect? Well, it, it affects us in three ways. The first way, it reduces the funds available for business to invest, and we call this a crowding out effect. And this is what it means. Let's say that the government needs $250 million to cover the deficit to balance the budget for the rest of the year. Well, now that $250 million that people are buying in bonds to the federal government, well, now that money can no longer be funded in the private investment. So if a corporation needs money and they don't want to give out any more stock options and they want to give out bonds, well, now there's more competition. Now the competition is more full because now you have government bonds and now you have corporate bonds. And it, it crowds it out. It makes less money available for the private sector, private investments. And as a result of that, that's going to slow down growth because those um, private corporations can't expand as quickly because there's not as much money available anymore. The second problem, the debt problem, is that those bondholders are buying those bonds knowing that they will get automatic interest included with the money they spent on the bond. The problem is that we have so much debt now, we only pay the interest on this debt. This is called serving the debt, servicing the debt when we only pay on the interest on the debt. So we're not even exactly making progress when it comes to paying off the national debt because we're only paying on interest. So let's say we have... 14, or let's say it's a trillion dollars that we're in debt. And let's say it's a million dollars a month in interest. Well, that would mean that we're only paying the million dollars a month to cover these expenses. But we're never getting down to the actual amount of money that we borrowed. So it's just servicing the debt. The third debt problem is foreign ownership. 
meaning other countries, we owe them millions and billions of dollars. Uh, it's no surprise that China is one of those, Japan and the United Kingdom. Those are the three largest uh, debt holders of our foreign government. And as a result of that, it's very difficult to make policy that is in our favor with these three countries because those three countries own part of our debt. And as a result of that, it's very difficult to tell them what to do or to have any power against them. Uh, right now with, with North Korea, China is kind of a, a big player in this because they're somewhat allies with North Korea. It's very difficult for us to tell China to stop trading with North Korea because we owe them so much money. It's hard to tell anybody anything what to do when you owe them money, when we owe them money. So has there been an effort to try to control this deficit? There has. 1985, they passed a bill called the, Auto the Graham Runman Hollins Act, which is three representatives that put this together. What it means is automatic across-the-board cuts in federal expenditures if deficit exceeds a certain amount. So what that means is if we're spending too much, if we hit a point where it, it's, let's say that the line is $100 billion and we go over that, these cuts automatically come into play where it starts cutting amounts of money from the budget. And as a result of that, that will automatically get us below that, that deficit number. Uh, federal government didn't like this. They actually repealed this. They said it was unconstitutional. And as a result, um, that bill was removed. Then another one was implemented in 1990. The purpose of this is by cutting entities or increasing taxes. So an act that required an expansion and funding for an entity must be designated money by cutting entities and increasing taxes. What that means, if we need to increase the budget, you cannot add this entity or this fund or whatever the program is into the budget unless you can secure um, tax revenue. If you cannot, well, then it's not a part of the budget. So it was a good attempt to do that. 1995, we tried passing a balance the budget amendment, which means it would be unconstitutional for us to overspend what we're bringing in in revenue. 1996, we actually had a surplus. We were moving in the right direction. So efforts have been made towards this. Um, but these automatic across-the-board cuts are very difficult to do because no one wants to take any money away from their funding. This was the 1995 Balanced Budget Amendment Report. Um, they needed a simple majority in order to pass this balanced budget, which would mean in the Senate, if there's 100 senators, yeah, I'm sorry, it's not a simple balance. It's uh, two-thirds needed to pass an amendment. So they needed 66 in order to pass it. And if you look here, the House passed it with no problem. They had the numbers to do it. But if you get to the Senate, on May, March 2nd, 1995, 65 um, were, would agree to it, said, yes, we should pass this. 35 said no. So we were one, one senator away from passing a balanced budget amendment in 1995. So then they tried again. And June 6, 1996, 64 to 35. So that means someone didn't show up for work today or, or who knows. They may have decided that they would step back and not vote at all, which they're allowed to do. So efforts have been made. It's been very close. Um, there hasn't been any recent talks about amendment, but you never know what, what could possibly take place. Now, since we returned to deficits, the stock market, the economic slowdowns, 9-11, all these have a part when it comes to the budget. Some will move us towards a surplus. Some will move towards a deficit. Uh, since we've been at war since 2002, our deficits Funding these Afghanistan and Iraq wars have been very expensive and been huge contributors to the deficit. Um, another contributor are baby boomers. These are the generation that were born right after World War II are getting older. They're getting an age where they're retiring and leaving the job market. So that means now we have less workers that are available. 
and people are living longer. So as a result, Social Security is being drained faster and Medicare as well is becoming very expensive. So we have a lot of contributors that are adding to the deficit. Now, needless to say, that doesn't mean that there could not be a turnaround. They, there could, but it would take some serious effort and budget cutting. Until we get to that point, we will probably continue doing deficits, but simple cuts here and there just across the board would really help us move in the right direction. Also, innovation and focusing on future job growth. Where is the job growth going to be in the future? and training and educating in that way too. So there are efforts that can be made to change this, but for now the deficit has continued to grow. This is the end of Chapter 15, Section 3.